thing here. And this topic that we're dealing with is lecture number two, which is going to be relativistic mechanics. Okay. And so what I really want to do when I look at this uh, relativistic mechanics here is that what you're going to be looking at here is that, I mean, this is real physics that we're doing now. And um, that makes me really, really happy. And it's not that we weren't doing physics beforehand. It was more of a way of thinking. Unfortunately, that way of thinking is painful where you have to sort of like, you know, move into that arena of having to sort of like believe certain things that are really kind of out there. I think this chapter has some few surprises, but not nearly as many. And everything that you already learned from uh, mechanics, like introductory calculus-based mechanics, does apply to what we're doing right now. Of course, if we get into more complicated situations, you know, then you have to bring in like physics 4B or physics 4C into the arena here. But I just want to say here that when I start talking about relativistic mechanics, what I'm really saying here is that mechanics is built around the three pillars of physics. And they're huge. Energy, momentum, angular momentum. And what we're finding here is that as we move from classical to relativistic physics here, the principle of relativity still applies. What do I mean that the principle of relativity still applies? The laws of physics are invariant for all inertial observers. So what we're saying here is that as I move to the relativistic regime, energy, momentum, and the angular momentum, which are your physical intuition, believe it or not, must be conserved under all situations. There's no exception. And so what we're going to find here is that somehow we're going to have to modify what we mean by energy, momentum, and angular momentum in this relativistic regime that we're going to be doing. And one of the first things that really comes up, and I'll hit this really hard a little bit later on in the lecture here, if I have time, or if not, I'll hit it on Wednesday, is that I want to talk about the role of mass in relativity. Now, mass plays a huge role. Of course it does, right? It's connected with energy, momentum, and angular momentum. And what you're going to find here is that if you think about the physical uh, explanation of what mass is, right? So the question is, what is the physical explanation of mass? We have something called inertial mass. And by the way, this topic of mass, oh gosh, it is so fascinating. I wish we could spend more time on it. But man, this is such, such a beautiful topic. When I say the word mass, what do we really mean by the word mass? And please don't tell me the law of inertia because I'll flunk your ass in this class. So what you find here is that the way we define mass is we call it inertial mass, and it's the net force divided by the acceleration. So little objects, small mass objects versus, you know, larger mass objects, you know, of course, are going to be harder to accelerate. And therefore, that 
really tells us all those details about it here. But in relativity, if you're going to look at this thing from a physics viewpoint, what do we mean by mass? Well, we have this thing called rest mass. Okay, what's going on? Somehow my pen's now. Let's see if it's working now. So rest mass is a definition that you're gonna see a fair amount of time. So let's talk about what rest mass is. So when I think of rest mass, what it does here is that everybody agrees that if we have something called mass or rest mass, what that means here is that you always bring an object to rest in your proper frame of reference. So what do I mean by that? Well, imagine that I have a block, okay? Here's my block of mass. And I know that this has a certain amount of mass. So what I'm gonna imagine here is that you can imagine that I have one frame of reference. And let's say, as what we've been talking about, we call this the, the Earth-based frame. And what I do here is that I take this mass and I have to bring it to rest in my frame. That means that in this frame, I have a weight scale. And in this frame, I take this mass and I slow it down in such a way that now I put it on my weight scale. And when I measure this, then I say that the mass of this block has a mass M. I measure it at rest in this frame. Or if I have a different frame of reference, let's say that in this frame of reference, I have my rocket here. And in this rocket frame, which is moving relative to this, to this earthbound frame. And when I'm looking at this frame here, what I have to do here is that I also carry my own weight scale. And so what I mean by rest mass is that I take this block and what do I gotta do? I gotta boost it into this frame. And so when I boost it into this frame here, I measure the mass of this guy in this frame. So that means that the mass is at rest relative to the weight scale. So when I go and I read this mass right here, the mass of this block is then going to be M prime. But note, in both of these cases, the block is at rest relative to weight scale. Therefore, all observers are going to measure the same rest mass. So the proper mass is the rest mass of that object. All observers are going to measure that. So just to make sure that we're starting to talk about what do I mean, mean by mass, the first thing that I'll do here is that I'll talk about mass, rest mass and relativity here. That's what they mean by rest mass. So now what I'm gonna do here is that you're gonna see in the discussion that I'm gonna be having here in the near future, it turns out that mass is a Lorentz invariant. And what you're gonna find here is that the rest mass is different than if I'm talking about what is the mass relative to you know, the earth frame as the rocket is moving. And 
you might, you know, if you look at textbooks, not textbooks, my bad. If you look at layman's book, they give you some dumbass uh, response where they say that mass objects get heavier as they get, you know, sped up, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a real shame that they actually do that. And I'm going to show you that it truly is a Lorentz invariant. And so I'm not there yet, but I'm just trying to say that I'm going to be talking about the word mass. And all we know from my very, very brief inarticulate conversation right here is that mass is a Lorentz, Lorentz invariant, which means that all observers, no matter what, whether you have it at rest in your frame of reference, or rather that object is moving relative to you, that mass is a Lorentz invariant, and therefore it's a constant in all frames of reference. It's a constant in all frames of reference. So now what I wanna do here is that I wanna continue to move and I wanna continue to move in and start with the, the principle of relativity. So now I wanna talk about, of course, the principle of relativity and what we know about the principle of relativity, which we've discussed quite a bit here already. But what does the principle of relativity tells us? It tells us what? That all, all the laws of physics are invariant for all inertial observers. Right? So the question is this. Um, what does this mean for mechanics? And when I think mechanics here, it's really the course that we call physics for it. So what that means here is that if I look at the principle of relativity, it tells me that conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum still have the same meaning in the relativity world. The laws of physics are the same in the relativity world, but, right, but we must be willing to change our definitions of individual quantities. And what do I mean by these individual quantities? Well, momentum. We're gonna have to change our, how we deal with, how we define momentum. We're gonna have to deal, how we deal with kinetic energy or potential energy. All these individual definitions are going to have to be modified. And, you know, one very, very simple example to show you what do I mean by this here. And I'll say, so as an example, to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, even though I cannot prove it to you yet, velocity. Um, can never reach C. And what I said here is that that is really 
the law of momentum or energy telling us this, but we haven't really talked about that yet. So I said that I would say this without proof, but what we're gonna find here, so, but classically, classical physics says that one can go faster than C, right? And what do I mean by that? That from a Newton's second law implies that the acceleration is this net force divided by the mass. So if I apply a net force for a very, very, very long time, then what I can do here is that I can get this thing. So if I accelerate, right? So if I accelerate for long enough, then I can see here that then V can exceed C here. But if I did this, what we would find here is it would violate Let me be careful here. I'll just say only one of them. It would violate relativistic momentum, since that's the way I'll first explain it to you. So that means then what this tells us here, that this tells us now is that we will have to modify Newton's second law. In other words, what I'm really saying here, is that in other words, not only modify Newton's second law, but what a force does in the space here. But if you modify force, right? If we modify what a force is, then there are ripple effects throughout mechanics. Okay, there's a ripple effect throughout mechanics. So what do I mean by this? So let's, let's show you what I mean. So if I modify, the force definition, well, what does that mean? I mean, well, look at momentum. There's the momentum impulse theorem. What does the momentum impulse theorem says? Well, that the momentum is equal to what? The change in momentum is the impulse. But wait a minute, you could see that the impulse has force. So all of a sudden, you could see that we have to modify momentum. There's no choice. And if we look at the work energy theorem, this tells us here that the work by definition is force dot it with the displacement vector. But wait a minute, if I look at the work, that's also the negative change in potential, which is the positive change in the kinetic energy. So that means by modifying the force, we automatically have to modify what we mean by kinetic energy and potential energy. And if I go to the angular momentum, impulse theorem. In this case here, the change in angular momentum is really what? The impulse created by a torque. But a torque is directly connected to the force, so therefore we have to change our definition of angular momentum. 
And that's what I mean about the ripple effects. Once you modify one of the parameters of mechanics, then we have to go in and modify everything. So what I want to do here is that I want to go in is that when I deal with the relativistic world, we have to make modifications there. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, to try to stress to you, and note that I keep coming back to these three pillars, conservation of energy, conservation of linear momentum, conservation of angular momentum. Man, we cannot, cannot let that slip through our hands. Physics goes, it, it would be so ugly, you would hate life. It would be such a louse to live in a world where those things are violated. But from a physical standpoint, you already know that they're not violated. And what I mean by that is that I'm gonna do a little aside for you because I want you to understand how important conservation, these three conservation laws are there. And the aside here, that I'll talk about here is that what this is here is that there's no way to let conservation laws to fall apart. By the way, if you like this definition of uh, relativistic mass where objects gets heavier and heavier and heavier as you know things are sped up as the layman terms say by the way you'd have to give up all the definitions that you know and love like the three pillars energy momentum angular momentum you'd even have to change what forces so it's like it's a big deal about screwing with mass in that way and i'll show you in a little bit here. So what you're gonna find here is that conservation laws, so these are the physical, oops, intuition. These are the physical intuitions you have and you may not understand that and i'm going to try to show you what this is here and what you're going to find here is that there was a very important theorem by a woman named emily uh, norther and she wrote a seminal paper in 1918 and the sad thing about this you know this woman here is that at that time, she, she couldn't publish papers. So she wrote down this theorem on continuous symmetries. And the only way she could get it recognized is she sent it to Einstein. Einstein read it, said like, oh my gosh, this is huge. So what did he do? He immediately put his name on the paper. By the way, his name was second. And he submitted it without any changes at all and it got published and then people said like wow this is the work of a genius and emily norther man she this is a huge theorem it's known as a norther's theorem and it says here it says this so i'll paraphrase it it says that any conservation law comes from a continuous symmetry of a system. I mean, you know, I should have just said symmetry of a system, but I'd be lying to you if I said that it was, even you, you know, you could say, well, maybe it's a discrete system. No, it's, it's typically 
it's a continuous symmetry. Now, I know that you have no idea what I just said here, but what I'm going to try to tell you is I'm going to show you what this actually means and why the laws of physics must remain invariant. Why in relativity, conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum must stand because it's such a huge thing. So if you have a time symmetry, what that does here is that that leads to conservation of energy. So if you were to look at the laws of physics at its most fundamental level, which is way beyond the scope of this course, if your laws, it's called the Lagrangian, if it's time invariant, then there's a symmetry that comes on. And that symmetry is this time symmetry and you, and conservation of energy just falls out. If you have a spatial symmetry, then you get conservation of linear momentum. If you have a rotational symmetry, then you get conservation of angular momentum. And I could go in and I could talk about, you know, all these different scenarios, whatever you want, sort of like what about charge symmetry? What about, you know, that's associated with the gauge, excuse me, charges, conservation of charge. What's conservation of charge? It's something called the gauge symmetry. And I could just keep going on. Anything you say, I could always associate a symmetry with the laws of uh, the equations that, you know, govern physics here. So why is this such a big deal? Well, let me tell you why it's such a big deal. It's your fricking intuition. It's a huge, huge thing here. And so my question is, what the hell does this mean, right? Why should you give a shit that this actually matters here? Well, let me tell you about conservation of energy. So if you look at conservation of energy, In this chapter, you're going to find out that mass is a form of potential energy. Okay, so mass is proportional to potential energy. So here's what you find here. So imagine that you have a weight scale, right? Here's my weight scale. And what you're going to do here is that you're going to come in and you're going to weigh this box. So you have this box that you're going to weigh. And what you're going to do now is that, let's say that you, you weigh, oops, you're going to uh, weigh this on Monday, right, today. So now what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the same box, you're not gonna change anything about this, and then you're gonna do a time translation. So physically, what do I mean by a time translation? That means you're gonna come back on Wednesday, and you're gonna weigh the same box. So now you're going to reweigh question what mass are you going to get if nothing has changed so let's say this box has a mass of 10 kilograms what is the mass going to be on Wednesday if nothing has changed same thing 10 kilograms it's going to be 10 kilograms in other words, your intuition tells you that time should not play any role in the mass of this object if it doesn't change. That is a direct 
consequence of conservation of energy. That's a big deal. And I could do the exact same thing with uh, conservation of linear momentum. And if I go to conservation of linear momentum, what we can do this time is that now imagine that we have a big table. And then I have my same weight scale. I put a weight scale right here. And I put another weight scale over here. So maybe this position here is where we call this the origin. And this position over here, let's say it's a, you know, 10 meters away. It's a long table. But I mean, what you're going to find here is that if I take that same box, and I weigh the box at this location, okay? And then I pick up the box and I move it over 10 meters. So what did I, what did I do? I'm going to do what? A spatial translation. Okay. I'm gonna do a spatial translation. So what is the box going to do? Well, when I, come over here and I put this box over here. What mass am I going to measure for this box? The changing it from this location to that location, would it change the mass of this thing? No, we don't expect by spatially moving a weight scale and measuring its mass to change here. So in other words, the mass is independent of spatial location. And therefore, that spatial separation is a direct consequence of conservation of linear momentum. And if I go to conservation of angular momentum, This time, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a top view. And what I'm having here is I'm going to have a table. So here's my table. And what you're going to see here is that I'm going to draw my weight scale more rectangular this time. And what I'm going to put in this weight scale is my mass this time. Okay, so what you're seeing here is that now I have a rectangular weight scale. Now, what am I going to do to that weight scale now? I'm going to rotate that thing. So now I'm going to look at a rotational translation. And when I do that, here's what I see. Well, it looks like this now. And if when I put in my box, the question that I'm asking here, do I expect the mass of that box to change because I rotated it into a different configuration? And the answer is, of course not. That is a direct consequence of an a, 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 um, a conservation of angular momentum. So, so we should say here is that rotating a weight scale has no effect on scale reading. And maybe not just that it's rotated, but that it's rotating. Shh. Yeah, sure. I mean, you're talking about a continuous rotation? Yeah, like it now has sure. Uh, sure. angular. Yeah, but, but really when you're looking at the laws, 
what you're really doing here is that you're looking at this thing here. So in this transformation, maybe I should have done this in red here, just to be really clear. What you're doing here is that you're, oops, you're doing the following thing here. You're actually moving from T to some T plus delta T. This has no effect on the system. And if I go to the spatial one, I'm going from X to X plus delta X, and that delta X has no effect on the system. And then if I do the rotation, you can imagine I'm going from, from theta to theta plus a delta theta, and it has no effects on that system. But my point is here, I'm here I am sort of like really, you know, saying like, under no circumstances can the laws of physics change. That's the reason why we will automatically redefine momentum and energy, you know, you know, to save our hide, to make sure that these laws are real because they're everything that we have. I mean, they're literally, they're huge, huge, huge things in physics and in your intuition and my intuition. So that's why we have to keep the same details about the conservation laws. The individual parameters like momentum, energy, and the angular momentum can change, but the overall concept of conservation laws must remain the same. So the easiest one to do is conservation of linear momentum. So let's look at that. So I want to start by how does conservation of linear momentum transform? So when I say conservation of, of uh, linear momentum, what I'm really asking here is that we know conservation of momentum must not have its meaning change. And again, you know, this is just a beautiful question. This is a question that, you know, we could get a beer and I could talk your ass off for the next five hours if you wanted to, because this topic is so damn beautiful. And what you find here is that this meaning is what we must retain under all circumstances. This implies here is that we must be willing to modify the individual momentum definition. And what I mean by that, this old information of what I call classical momentum, that cannot have that same shape. It cannot have that same shape. So what I'm really saying is that I'm saying this, momentum by itself is not a Lorentz invariant. And now that we're out of that first goddamn topic. We can now start talking about the real meaning of relativity. And relativity is about invariance, not about stuff that is not invariant, but what's invariant, because that's the most reliable thing that we can calculate. So what we're going to find here is that when I look at conservation of momentum, right?
what we mean here is that if I look at the total momentum initially, and I look at the total momentum afterwards, I'm really looking at individual momentums like this here. So, must remain true, must be modified. That's what I mean by this whole statement right here. So, so then that kind of really tells us, you know, it tells us what's going to happen here. So what this really means here is that, so if I look at the individual momentum, implies then, if I look at the relativistic momentum, this cannot equal the classical momentum. Unless the limit where V is much, much smaller than C, we would expect the relativistic momentum to approach the classical physics. Why? Because we use momentum all the time. And because we use momentum all the time and it works perfectly good, the relativistic one has to do that. And, and another thing here, when I, say, when I say that conservation of momentum must remain true, it's really a constant, but I really mean by it that it's a Lorentz invariant, that all observers are going to measure the laws of physics to be the same. So the total momentum is a Lorentz invariant. So now what I want to do here is that I want to do a thought experiment that's going to show you that violates momentum. Now the algebra is really bad. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to give you a picture to kind of think about this thing, whole thing. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to do a thought collision experiment. Now the question is, why a collision one? Collisions are about momentum. The vast majority of the collisions in this world are uh, inelastic, not elastic, and as a consequence, you can't use energy. So that's what we're really, really talking about right there. And what you're going to see here is that this is going to really be a twofold thing that I want to do. So there's really two goals here. The first goal is to really show you that classical um, momentum will violate conservation of momentum. That's one of the goals, okay? That as soon as we take classical physics and we do a boost, a Lorentz boost, you're gonna see that there's a violation. And then the other thing here is that, um, you need to be very good collision experts because you're going to because what you're going to have to do here is that you're going to be jumping into different observers where you're going to be looking at a collision and this example really sort of like starts to set the tone like what do I mean I boost into this frame oh, oh I'm boosting into that frame 
what, what, what is the collision very, very different? And you're going to see that we're going to have collision problems where you have to be able to move, let's say, from the lab to the center of mass frame. Or maybe you move into a frame of one of the particles that's moving. So you've got to be able to see that much, 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 much better. And so that's another reason why I'm doing this. The more practice you do that, the better you'll be off as we head towards the end of the chapter. So what I want to do here is that I want to break this thing into four different cases. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to look at a very simple collision. So we're going to look at an example here. And this is a simple collision between two balls of same mass. That means M1 is equal to M2. And I'm going to assume that this mass is really what? And so what you're, you're, you're seeing here is that this is sort of like a billiard ball collision. So the, the simplest one that you could possibly imagine. So here's case one. This is going to be a one dimensional collision. And what you're going to find here is that I'm going to always have the same speed. So if I have Vx term, I'm going to call that speed A just because it's going to be easier to sort of like identify. And if I have a speed in the y direction, I'm going to call that B. And then I'm going to set up my coordinate system. The way I'm going to set up my coordinate system here is that I'm going to set it up and I'm going to use the standard coordinate system. So this is the positive y, the negative y, positive x, minus x. So this way, we, this tells me here, if I'm moving in this direction, in this red, then this red v tells me that it must be what? It only has a component in the x direction, so then I'm going to write this as a zero for the velocity, right? Nice and simple here. And if I have a different velocity, let's say that it moves in this direction, you could see that this is what? In the third quadrant. So when I look at this green velocity, it has a negative component for both the x and the y. So I should have minus a minus b. So just very, very simple language. So let's go look at this thing here. Here we go. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to look at a collision. And this collision is going to take place along the, um, the y-axis. So here's my y-axis. And I'll put the x here just for a brief moment here. But what you're really seeing here is that I have two billiard balls. One is going to be red. The other one is going to be blue. And they're both moving. What speeds are they going to move? They're always moving with the same speeds. So then you could see here that this billiard ball has a certain momentum initial, and the red one I'm calling number one. The blue one I'm going to call number two, and it's also moving with some momentum initially in that direction. So this is a very standard collision here. And then so what you're seeing here is that on this side of the dashed line, this is before the collision. After the dashed line, this is after the collision. So what's going to happen to the billiard balls after the collision? Well, since they're billiard, they got the same mass, they're going to exchange momentums. So in other words, I'm going to have the red ball and the blue ball moving in opposite directions. So this guy's going to move with the final momentum in that direction. The blue ball is going to move in this direction like that. Now, instead of drawing these little balls here, 
what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to change it. And what I'm going to make it here is I'm going to simplify my notation. I'm going to say, I really have the momentums going like this. So those two pictures, these are the same pictures, but one is simplified compared to the other one. So far, so good. So what, what's happening here? So what I'm happy, what's happening here is that I have an observer. And what frame is this observer in? It's in the S frame. What frame is this? Well, it's just the rest at frame relative to where this collision is actually taking place here. So this observer is at rest and the center of mass location. Okay, and that's what he would see. So now, let's go look at conservation of momentum here now. So now, if I look at conservation of momentum, we know that the total momentum initially must be that of after the collision. In other words, since they have the same mass, note that I can write the velocities and the mass separated like this. And so if I look at this thing here, what you're seeing here is look at the momentum of, of uh, ball number one. It's moving in which? The positive direction. So when I look at this thing, what does it actually read here? Well, I have a momentum. Let me do a block here, a square bracket. I have the initial momentum. No, there's no X component. So I'm gonna write that as zero. This guy's moving in the B direction. And now if I look at the ball two here, that guy also has no X component but the momentum is in the negative direction. So I'm gonna write minus B. So when I look at this thing after the collision, what do I have? Well, you're gonna see here after the collision, uh, the final momentum for ball number one is going down. So then I'm gonna write minus B and then the blue is going up. So then that gets plus B. So when I look at this thing here, what you're actually seeing here is that you're seeing what? That this is really zero B minus B, which is of course zero, zero for the momentum. And then this case here, I'm gonna get zero, and then I'm gonna get minus B plus B, which is of course zero, zero. Now note that this becomes tedious to actually write. So what I'm gonna do here, is that I'm going to summarize in a table. And the way I'm gonna summarize this in the table is that I'm gonna have the before, I'm gonna have the after, and then I'm gonna look at ball number one. And then when you look at this here, what was the velocity of ball number one. Well, it's zero B, so I'm gonna write, what's the momentum afterwards? Well, it's zero minus B. And then if I look at the momentum of ball number two, I could see here that the momentum of two starts off with this guy right here, which will be zero minus B, and then afterwards, it's now moving in the positive direction, which is zero plus B. So then if I look at conservation of momentum here, then I'm really looking at the total momentum. Okay, if I look at the total momentum, then what you're seeing here, that this is going to be what? Mass, now I gotta add these together, which will give me zero B minus B, which will give me mass times zero, zero. And then if I look at the momentum afterwards, I'm gonna get mass times zero, and I'm gonna get minus B plus B, which will give me mass zero, zero. 
And so according to conservation of, uh, come on, of angular moment, excuse me, a linear momentum here, you could see that the momentum before and the momentum afterwards are exactly the same. So I'm gonna use these tables with these pictures and not try to draw them, you know, not go through all these details, okay? So now let's go look at the next case here. So now I wanna keep making the situation more and more complicated. So here we go. So the next step that I want to do here, so I want to go to case number two. Uh, so the, does the ball um, go from the positive and then negative and then negative positive? I still... Right, l l look at the ball number one. If it's going up, then that's the positive y direction, right? That's how I defined it up here. Here's my positive y direction. So if P1 initial is in the positive direction, then its speed must be zero B. Okay. Because I defined the Y component to be B. Okay. And then if I look at what, ha what it does afterwards, you could see that it's in the negative direction. So therefore its velocity now is zero minus B because there's no X component to the collision. Okay. And then I do the exact same thing with two. Two is in the negative direction so you could see that I wrote zero minus B. And then afterwards it's going up, so it should be zero plus B. Uh, okay. And then momentum is just the sum of all of the momentum. So I'm adding this momentum plus that momentum. So for example, if I look at the total momentum initially, then it should be what? Um, it should be that if I add them, I'm gonna get the momentum of one initially plus the momentum of two initially. And if you look at this here, this should be zero plus B and this guy should be zero minus B or two. Yeah. And so what you're seeing here is that when I add these two together, I'm gonna get zero, then I'm gonna get minus like this, which means M of zero, zero. So total momentum is zero in this case. Okay. 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 Now okay. let's go to the next situation. So in case two, what okay. I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a two-dimensional collision. And so in this thing here, I'm going to imagine that it looks something like this here. So remember, I'm using the same masses, the same speeds, no matter what. So this time what's happening is that I have my ball number one and my ball number two that now have two dimensions. In other words, I have my red ball that comes in with momentum P1 initial. I have my blue ball that comes in with P2 initial. And this collision right here is exactly the same as this collision. But now they're coming in, let's say at 45 degree angle. They don't have to come in at 45 degree angle, by the way. So what's gonna happen here? Well, after the collision, the red ball moves in this direction. The blue ball moves in the opposite direction with, the, with its final component like this here. So where's my observer now? My observer is still here. My observer is still at the center of mass location, right? He's at the center of mass. So what does conservation of momentum say here now? Let's set up the table again. So if I set up the table, I'm gonna have the before, the after. So now let's go look at what the speed of the of particle number one is. Okay, so again, this is particle number one. Well, let's look at that. Look at the component P1 initial. Which direction is it headed? It's headed in the first quadrant. But it's moving along the Y and X axis, so therefore 
its velocity component must be AB. Now let's look at particle number two. Initially, you could see that P2 initial is headed into what? The third quadrant. If it's the third quadrant, then that means I must attach negative signs to it. So then what happens to P1 final? Well, you could see it's in the fourth quadrant, which means then that its X direction is the same, but its B has switched signs because it's now going in the negative direction. And if I look at two, you could see that it's in the second quadrant. So therefore, A is negative, but this time B is positive. So now I have conservation of angular momentum now. So if I look at conservation of angular momentum, what does it tell me here? Well, I know that the total momentum is then going to be equal to m of u1 plus u2. So let's add these guys. So if I add these guys, what am I going to get? That means I got to add these two guys together, right? I got to add these two. Oh, wait, wait, sorry about that. I got to add these two guys together, my bad. So if I look at these guys, this has to be what? A minus A. So note, I added the X components. Now I got to add the B components, which will give me B minus B, which will give you M zero, zero. Now it's momentum conserved. I got to look at the collision afterwards. So now I got to look at um, these guys now. So if I look at these guys, What's the initial moment? What's the final momentum? It's got to be this plus that. So I'm going to get A minus A. And then if I look at the Bs, you can see that the Bs switched this time. So then gives me this here. So in other words, momentum is conserved in this scenario right here. Okay, beautiful. Let's go to the next complicated one. So this time, Here's what we're going to have now. So now, I now have a two-dimensional collision with an S prime observer. So what do I mean by an S prime observer? So it looks like this here. So what I need here is that I need to define my frames of reference here. So this is the center mass frame of reference and I have my observer. And this observer is the one that's been viewing all the collisions now. But now what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna do a boost. I wanna go in and I want to boost to the S prime frame of reference. And what do I mean by an S prime frame of reference? What you're going to see here is that we're going to have some skater dude or dudette, if you want to say it any way you want. And what this, this person is doing here is that they're now going to move with some relative velocity. In fact, they're going to move with the relative velocity that's exactly A. Right? So this is going to be my S prime. So in other words, what I'm really saying is that this is the Vx speed of ball number one, okay? It's the speed of ball number one horizontally. So what I want to do now, so I'm going to bring this over a little bit because I want the space, is that what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to ask the question, what does observer, what does the S prime observer see of 
the collision. Okay, what does it see the collision as? Okay, so picture wise, let's go back to the other collision. So if you're looking at this, so now if I was to really ask this question, if I was to sort of like cut and paste here, I know this will piss some of you off, it's okay. We're among friends anyways. So if I do that, and if I was to actually look at this picture over here, oh damn, what happened here? Let me get rid of that shit. I thought I, what I really need is I need this picture right here. So if I come over here and I paste it, where is that observer going to be here? Where is this chick going to be sitting at? She's sitting right here on top of the ball. So she's moving horizontally on ball number one. Okay? So she's moving in this direction with the velocity A. And that's what, she, but on the skateboard, she's not on the ball, of course, she's too heavy. She'd stop the ball from moving. So she has to be on the skateboard moving in that frame. So what you're seeing here is that now, what does the collision look like? Relative to her, what does the red ball do now? The red ball has no, no X direction. What happens to the red ball? Well, it goes up. And then what does it do? It comes right back down. It doesn't see the X component. Okay. Now the blue ball is going to be different now. So let's look at that blue ball here. So the blue ball is still coming in this direction here. But what I want you to do here is that I want you to think about this thing physically. What was your question, Anthony? Yeah, wait, wait. So um, that um, ball in the red, you can't see that component because it's going down or? No, no, because it's, because she's, as far as she's concerned, the ball never moves horizontally in her frame. The ball just goes straight up and straight down. Okay. Okay. Right? Because you could imagine if I go back into this picture right here, right? If I'm following the ball here, I can't tell that it's, if I'm on the ball, I don't know that it's moving horizontally. I only know that it's moving up because of the velocity component, right? And in other words, her speed is moving, right? If I was to really look at that, her speed is at Vx equal to A. The ball speed is Vx equal to A. So because there's no relative motion between the two frames, right? No relative motion along x-axis, that implies the ball is at rest in the x-axis. That's why the red ball only goes up and down. So before we get into the sort of like the, you know, the, the transformation here, I want to look at this thing more physically first here. So let's look at the, so to determine motion of ball number two, let's do it the physical way first here. Okay. So the physical approach looks something like this here. So remember, this collision is no different than case number one, okay? This collision is really not any different. 
So what you're gonna see here, when I look at collision three here, what am I really seeing here? Okay, so if I look at one dimension, what I'm gonna do here is that I'm gonna look at a red ball. And what's this red ball doing here? Well, it's gonna move speed u. Now, if I look at the blue ball, what do I know about the blue ball? Well, they're moving at the same speed, u here. Now, now what I wanna do here is that we know this is ball number one and this is ball number two. So now what I'm gonna do here is that I'm gonna boost into number one's frame of reference. So if I boost into this frame of reference, what this tells me here is that the red ball now has what speed? It's stationary. But wait a minute. If I look at the, the, moment, the speed between these two guys here, that means that the blue ball must now be doing what? Moving with twice the speed. So it's moving twice the speed because... Um... Right, because now I had the observer right here. Okay. Now the observer is right here. Okay. No, I get it. So when I look at this, if I jump into a frame where in that direction, that, that is zero, then the other one now must be moving twice as fast. And by the way, this is exactly what the Galilean transformations do, right? So this was the physical approach, but we can also do the Galilean. Um, velocity boost. And what I mean by that here is that if I take an X direction like this, right, and I boost into a frame. So what's the relative velocity in this case here? The relative velocity now tells me that V is equal to U and so this tells me here is that I'm going to get u minus u. So therefore, in that uh, prime frame where I jump, right, this is the s prime frame that I jumped into, I should have zero. Okay, and that's exactly what it's telling me. But the y velocity should still be u. So now let's translate this into our problem now. So what do I know? I have a transformation of A to B, okay? This is, so now I'm looking at P1 initial. So if I look at ball number one, this implies here is that if I look at the velocity transformation, I start off with what? I start off with u initial of a plus b. And then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna do a transformation. If I do a transformation, I'm gonna do the boost. And what does the boost tell me? It says that now, look at this ux minus v, this has to be what? a minus a. And then b doesn't get changed at all in the y direction. So that's going to be zero B, which is exactly what we concluded from the physics of it. But now let's look at ball number two. Ball number two is now what? It's moving at minus A and minus B here. Now I do the boost. So what does the boost say here? Well, I look at the velocity transformation and what does it say? Look what it says minus a, minus a, and what happens to the b? Nothing happens to, to, to the y's, so I should get minus b. So what am I gonna get? Minus 2a, minus b. So look, look at the two here. 
Look at the two right here. They're one and the same. Here we did the physics approach. Here we did the Galilean transformations. So I get the exact same thing. So let's go set up the table now. So now what's going to happen to the blue ball? Well, the blue ball is going to do what? It's going to move in this direction now. Oops. So let's go set up the table and do this picture again. So now if I have this picture, just so that because I, I'm going to have to keep going up and down, here's my picture. So now let's go set it up. What's the before? What's the after? So here's my first velocity now. So my first velocity, we could see that if I'm moving in the S prime frame, that guy tells me what? This guy has no X component, only a B component. What happens afterwards? They come back down with that exact same velocity. But now let's look at what happens with the second ball. The second ball, we know that the Y component doesn't change, only the X component. But physically, it's going what? 2A and minus B. So from that X viewpoint, we have twice the velocity. And then afterwards, it's still moving in the X direction, but now it moves in the positive direction. So when I look at the momentum in this new prime frame, what does it look like? Well, we just got to add these guys. And if I add these guys, I'm going to get what? I get mass times the quantity. I add the X's. I add the Y's. And so what do I get? I get M of minus 2A zero. That's the total momentum before the collision. The question is, what is the momentum after the collision? So then I do the exact same thing. I add the X's, so I get zero minus 2A, and then I add the B's, and you can see that I get the exact same thing. So as far as we're concerned here, Galilean boost conserve linear momentum. Right? No, no, not a surprise. But there's one small problem, right? Oh wait, damn, I'm out of time, shit. Ugh. I gotta get out of here.